Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello, welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, in this week's show, I'll be talking all about resilience, how to overcome trauma, deal with stress, and work under pressure. I'm joined by one of the world's leading brain surgeons and neuroscientists, Dr. Rahul Jandiel. We'll discuss how we can enhance our performance from neural efficiency to breathing techniques and lots, lots more, as well as things he uses when working under pressure. Rahul has a brand new book out, Life on a Knife's Edge, a brain surgeon's reflections on life, loss, and survival. Rahul, welcome to the show. How's it going? It's good. Thank you for the kind introduction. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for joining us and for staying up so late. You're over in California. Uh, you have a fantastic <laughs> internet connection, which is brilliant. Let's get cracking. I want to, I, I suppose, chat about yourself, first of all, and we get to know you a little bit better, and then we can get into you know, some, of the t some of the content that's in the book. How did you get into, how did you become a neurosurgeon? Well, not, not the way all my friends became neurosurgeons, at least the ones in the craft. You know, I dropped out of university for two years. I was working as a security guard. I took a year off before going to medical school, took a few years off in brain surgery training to get a PhD. It's been unconventional, but um, I think it's been fantastic because I didn't come at it with the same uh, preconceived notions about wanting to be a brain surgeon from a young age. I kind of fumbled into it. And so, although I enjoy the craft, I think I bring for my patients an understanding of human nature and in caring for them, I've learned about human nature as well. And I have a lot of gratitude for them uh, for sharing their experiences with me. And in the book, you write about some of those experiences with, with past patients in terms of trauma and stress. Uh, tell us about some of those cases that have stuck with you the most over the course of the years and why they've stuck with you. Yeah, and part of it is a bit of a psychological memoir. I think if somebody's going to talk about trauma or stress or threat or big topics like life, belief, I wanted to share that I've been through my own struggles. So the reader would know this isn't just an analysis or some academic thing. Um, but trauma is interesting. I mean, that's chapter one. And I, and I describe some experiences of my own and things I've seen and what I've learned from uh, what I've learned from patients. And the first thing I want people to know about trauma is that it requires memory. It just in the most basic sense, some, pa some of our patients don't have memory either from the disease they come with sometimes as a result of the operation, despite our best efforts, they don't have PTSD. They can't remember the thing that happened that's going to torture them going forward. So memory is requisite to how we cope with trauma. And now all the way to the other side, what I would say is memory is malleable. It's not, it's not like a fixed thing, different moods, different emotions. You can recover it, you reconstruct it. And so if you think of it as malleable and moldable and that you can reconstruct it. So if you are perseverating or stuck on a certain thought from an experience that you had in the past, it is possible, it is possible to reshape the emotional context around that memory. It's not easy. It, it might not work for everybody. There is no golden nugget I can give you for that. But that understanding empowers people that you don't have to be stuck in that loop of toxic thoughts about an assault or an attack or an experience or even surgery. And I think that's empowering to people that memory is malleable. And people are finding like, even with ecstasy or Molly or, you know, MDMA, you can reshape memory for PTSD. It does require a therapist to guide you through it. There's no magic pill, but it can open the doors to perception where memory can be reshaped. So trauma will occur because we have memory and we put ourselves out in the world, but it doesn't have to be permanent, the residue of it. I think that's the inspiring message about trauma. Uh, and a little tidbit is then there's all like at the, at the ground level, people are finding immediately after trauma, it's probably better not to read or talk. It might be better to do something physical. There's something distracting where like a physical task uh, keeps that traumatic memory from settling down as much as, uh, you know, less than if you were uh, reading or communicating. So that doesn't mean you change therapeutic practice right now, but it's exciting how people are looking at it at the ground level and all the way up to the conceptual level. One of the things you mentioned there was your own trauma and people being able to associate with that. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, um, 
you know, trauma is a personal dimension. I, I don't measure mine with others. Um, it doesn't have to be physical. Um, you know, when I was young, when I was 13, I saw an airplane crash above my hometown in Los Angeles. That was traumatic, but I didn't remember it. And I, and I liked not having remembered it. And it came back to me. So, you know, people talk about repressed memories. So I don't ask, I don't have any judgment. I mean, if you've gone through something horrible and you've repressed it, maybe it's okay. I, I don't have the answers for that. I had repressed it until there was a big automotive pileup when I was in training at a trauma center and all the clothes and the pieces and the, and the bodies and the work reminded me of that. But I was in a constructive place. And so reopening or visiting that memory actually uh, helped me put it in a better place. Um, and that was, that was interesting in that way. Also, you know, I had some experiences with violence um, with a, a neighbor that became, you know, evolved into uh, a neo-Nazi and there was some violence there. Um, that's under in chapter seven for threat. And, but that in a strange way, that was a, you know, I, I had meaning and purpose in that trauma. It didn't matter that my rib was broken. We stood our ground. I stood my ground. My mother was inside. You know, it, that, that never settled poorly with me. But then, you know, there was a child that, it wasn't a mistake, but it was a complication. And, the, and she was paralyzed after I, I tried to help her. Now that was traumatic. So, you know, so I, from my journey, I started to think, wait a second, repressed memory opened it, it was better, physical violence, altercation in front of my home, didn't feel traumatic, you know, complication with a child haunted me, uh, potentially, you know, clinically likely, you know, pushed me into depression, but though that is the spectrum of my trauma. And then there's the trauma of, of my cancer patients with their diagnosis and scans every three months. I think from all of that, I try to bring that into this chapter. And, and, I, and I think people will find something in it that they haven't thought about before. Yeah, and it's fair to say that trauma is very much individual, that we all have traumatic experiences and it's all relative to each person. Sure. And do you think in your experience, it's possible for someone to fully overcome trauma? I think so. I think so. And, and, and to give you the clearest example of that is uh, my, my cancer patients, they, you know, trauma patients, they, they have the trauma, then they cope with it. They, if they didn't wear a seatbelt, it's harder. If they wore a seatbelt and the trauma, you know, there's, there's things there, but a cancer patient every three months, they get a little you know, note from me for a brain MRI and they're in the machine. That's a traumatic event every three months. Yet the finish line has come closer. And how do you make the most of those days? And whereas, you know, I haven't faced cancer in my life, my personal health, but sometimes I just think, man, I'd spiral compared to how they're doing. They come and ask me about my day. They tell me about fun they've had. It's just fascinating that, that not all of them, I, I don't want to create a picture of like, yeah, you know, but a surprising number of them have found clarity and quality of life where we would think it's just a daily calamity. And so they do live with trauma. They do overcome trauma. Uh, they do reshape their memories of surgery, of chemotherapy and that sort of thing. And I think that's an inspiring message for people, no matter where they are, whether they're recovering from a trauma haven't been inflicted with a trauma yet, wherever they are, there's no way that, you know, there's statistics that say like, just based on, you know, 75% of people experience something traumatic, obviously traumatic in their lifetime. We put ourselves out there. It's going to hurt one day or another. I want to chat about the brain's ability to deal with pressure because I'm really interested in that. Obviously over the course of the last year, year and a half, we've been put under pressure mm -hmm like never before with dealing with a global pandemic and all the stress and pressure that that might bring with it. Tell us about the brain's ability to deal with that and how, and how that, you know, how that works. Well, um, th that's a, that's a layered question. So I'm going to have to get into it because I, I want people to leave with an understanding rather than, I mean, we have, you know, we can give them tips also, but here's the understanding of how to deal with stress or how to conceptualize what happens with stress what happens with pressure. It, it, the whole field is called emotional regulation. And so if you look at our brains, 
it, they're it's they're not homogenous. It's not like pudding or flan. It's they're actually like babushka dolls. There's like the reptilian brain, and it looks different. And then there's something else popped up on top of it. The emotional brain. It's called the limbic system. It looks different anatomically and under a microscope. And then there's this blossoming cortical canopy behind our foreheads. Actually pushed our foreheads forward just to fit in there. It's so so much acreage. It had to be wrinkled like an accordion to fit inside our skull. Right. That's the Think of that as the thinking brain. Well, those aren't three distinct areas. The, the thinking brain and the uh, emotional brain are, they intersect. The neurons are intertwined. And the more you work on emotional regulation, the more they branch. There's actually a neuroscience word called arborization. And we call it a cortical canopy. So if you start to see your brain not as wires, but a garden, and you start to see the lushness of your life under stress and pressure is that is that overlap between thought and emotion. You can't be all thought, you can't be all emotion. So where is that dial, that that thermostat you set for yourself? That is how you manage with the potential to manage with stress and pressure. So now let's get more practical. How does thought control emotion? If you see a plastic snake, you don't jump twice at it. Your emotional response happens. And the next time you say, nah, don't worry about that. When you're in a movie theater, you see something scary, you the adrenaline, the same adrenaline when you're actually being chased is coursing through you when you're watching a movie, yet you don't flee. So you, there is context to the emotions you're feeling. There's context to the chemicals and hormones in your stress response that you're feeling. And so how do I deal with uh, stress or pressure? Not, not perfectly, but the things that have helped me. One is there must be time to turn our attention inward. It, it, we're not just sensate. We are, we, there's introspection. And every day should have some moments of reflection to think about, did we feel that too much or not enough? Does that response earn a right to be in our lives? And then in the moment of stress, the, the thing that is proven biologically is controlling your breathing. So people always sort of trip out about that, like we got a brain surgeon talking about breathing. There's, but there's biology for that. Hyperventilating can give you a panic attack. That's the simplest explanation. So controlling your breathing on the flip side can ha actually help you be calm. And we've studied this in, in neurosurgery where they put in electrodes and people live in hospitals and they did breathing meditative techniques and the electricity got calm. The same goal that sedatives and Valium do, the same chemicals they act on, you can release from the pharmacy of your own mind by getting your breathing under check. When you feel that fight coming on with a boss or a conflict with a lover or the case sort of losing control of the operation uh, and trying to find your way back into something, uh, those are the ways in which I've dealt with um, pressure and stress. Now, that doesn't mean that that happens tomorrow, but I, I hope people are like, wait a second. So it's possible. There's a basis for it. Um, let me try to develop that through my life. You were born and you learned to walk. You were a child and you matured into an adult in adolescence, but the work doesn't stop there. The cultivation of our emotional regulation is a lifelong process. So that way, when you get to the next struggle, uh, you're better equipped for it. Okay. Folks, you're listening to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, Association with Leia Healthcare, We're having a fascinating conversation all about the brain, <laughs> brain health, and breathing. And we have chatted about breathing before on the show. We had James Nestor on from San Francisco mm -hmm. a couple of months ago. Fascinating conversation around breathing. And it seems to be coming up time and time again. He's a good and guy. Th and it's a, free. <laughs> which is the best thing of all. But, there, you know, it's interesting from a medical perspective that more and more people are, 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 are promoting and talking about breathing and just how important it is. And it's, it's getting your breathing under control, making those simple changes can make a big difference to how we deal with stress, how we cope with stress, and also the decisions that we make under stress as well. Because so many people do that, they make bad decisions like when it comes to stress. I like what you said about that. Like, just because you get your breathing right doesn't mean you're gonna solve the puzzle or the stress in front of you, but you will be at your personal optimal situation to deal with the crisis in front of you. And at a minimum, you haven't made it worse on yourself by by giving yourself a panic attack, right? No, that's well said the way you put it. And, and is it fair to say too, though, that we do need stress? Like there is, you know, there is an element of stress that is healthy 
uh, and trying to alleviate any stress from your life isn't necessarily a good thing. So some stress right. is important for our brain health and for our overall health. Well, I'll give you, a, a, again, a biological example, because that, you know, we can have that conversation, but I like to show people what happens. So for 100 years, we thought the brain was static. You get these 100 billion neurons. That's all you got. Then we started finding little niches, germinal niches, like parts of your garden that can create new plants and flowers. And so those germinal niches will make new brain cells. Not if you're under too much stress, they stay dormant. If you're stress-free, they stay dormant. Hey, man, why kick up? So there's this like, you know, you stress this sort of EU, meaning, you know, a healthy stress, a challenge, um, a responsibility, uh, having to cope, being just a bit out of your comfort zone. That is actually the cue for those neural stem cells to gestate and deliver little baby neurons that go to our hippocampus, which is part of the emotional brain and memory region. So like that's biology that is out there for 20 years and I like the way you frame that because I find that my patients have become frustrated some people that well I'm not resilient I you know these aren't static like moments of arrival these are processes you know you're coping uh, and resilience is also a word that I struggle with because the way it's been shared is not the way I've come to understand it so there's two types of psychological resilience. It's not just coming back to your old form, like an engineering def- definition. It's it's more about um, a new, more fortified version of your own self. And there's two types. There's systemic resilience. That's what you've got in you. That's what you bring to the fight or the struggle. But then there's also processive resilience, what the fight brings out in you or what the struggle brings out of you, like this pandemic. So no matter where you are, if you're struggling, you could have your best moments ahead. This struggle could be leading to your growth. If you're doing well, great, continue to do well. That leaves people more empowered rather than, oh, I'm struggling, so I'm not resilient. Uh, uh, my cancer came back, so I didn't beat cancer. These kind of, the language we're using to describe our the mind and behavior and neuroscience, I think it is constraining the dialogue and making some people feel guilty that they failed when, when they're just flowing through life and all its ups and downs. Let's chat about neural uh, efficiency. Mm. I think as a term, it's really interesting, but obviously mm. it, 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 it's interesting to chat about to bring it up and it does come back obviously to breathing as well. So let's chat a little bit around that. So neural efficiency is something that elite athletes uh, are into. How, what is the, what is the way to, not overthink, um, you know, kicking a goal, you know, it's almost dancing. The more, you know, like the more you think about it, it's going to, it's going to show. And what people are surprised with is a skill that's mastered or close to it will actually engage fewer parts of your brain. Um, It's more than a habit. It's a craft. It's something you have to let go of and and let it be delivered from you, potentially in this thing they call the flow state, your brain waves and electricity and the currents, which is how things work uh, in there. Those that that garden is electrical and chemical tends to have a certain rhythm, you know, like a lake that's got a certain ripple is what you're trying to go for. And neural efficiency is, is how to, how to help have people understand that when you learn something well, thought will make you less efficient. Thinking about the moves, thinking about the dance move, thinking about the performance will recruit that cognitive brain that we like to tamp down the emotions if they're running wild. But when you're trying to deliver a performance, you don't want thought to come in and inter- interrupt that. And that's why we started with it's a balance between thought and emotion and and neural efficiency and and performance is letting thought get out of the way and releasing the training that you've, you know, done for decades, like for Olympians or ballerinas. So that is a nuance that falls differently than, 
you're mad because something happened at work, then your brain is not going to be efficient. You're actually actively trying to tamp down a part of your brain. Whereas in neural efficiency for performance, you're saying, just get out of the way. And, and the, the areas that the brain uses are different in both those contexts. And how can we bring that into, I suppose, into daily life? Is that being able to step back from a stressful situation uh, or a bad decision in terms of what you eat or having that row at work? Is it, is it the ability mm. to step back from that and see the bigger picture, to breathe, to create a sense of calmness and then deal with the situation or then make the decision around food or movement or whatever it may be? Right. So neural efficiency fits more under elite performance, in my opinion. The, you know, how to deal with life as it stirs you in a way that you don't want to be stirred. It, it, is, it is all about getting your breathing right. That lets your thought have some more influence because if you don't get your breathing right, you're panicking and now thought is like in the next room. So get your breathing right. Turn your thoughts inward. Take a moment. See if you can uh, elect to feel what you're feeling. Um, you might fail today, but you try tomorrow. You try next year. And then over time, it's, it's an ability that we can cultivate. It's harder when you're a teenager. Maybe we're overconfident in our 20s, but that's our responsibility and opportunity. It's not an automatic thing. You have to, if you patch up an eye, it won't work. That part of the brain will be derelict. If you don't force a kid to walk and teach them to walk, they won't develop. If you don't allow teenagers to mature, they won't. If adults don't cultivate emotional regulation, you can't just assume it's going to be there. Okay, so it's like anything. It's practice makes perfect. It's, it's practicing that sense of, you know, uh, that creating that sense of calm, practicing your breathing in yep. stressful situations. Right. And with practice, it gets easier. Right. And, but, and that practice, whereas a physical, you know, like playing soccer or football, as it should be called, right? It's football. <laughs> uh, you know, that you're trying to practice the same thing. But the practice you do in your own mind is a very personal game. And um, no one can, no one can uh, go on that journey with you and no one can spare you from it. The book is about reflections on life, loss and survival. And one of the things I'm really interested in is the learning from working with patients. And you've worked with a huge amount of patients over, over your, your right. career so far and lots more to come, I'm sure. What have you learned from them? So I'm intrigued in, to talk to people who have you know, dealt with patients like you have and the learnings that we get from them in terms of do they have common regrets or common things they right. wish they had done more of or less of, or, you know, yeah. it, it, I think it's a fascinating learning to be able to learn from people like that. Yeah. Thank you. The, uh, I mean, I've met over 10,000 people and opened over 3000 skulls and the journey that comes from before and after. And it's, that's what happened the last four or five years is I started to step back and say, wow, this is a masterclass in humanity. And I would say the, <clears throat> they do have a lot of regrets about time wasted and part of our um you know part of the things we measure for cancer dr uh, drugs and cancer treatments is quality of life we don't really ask that if you're going to get a knee replacement but if there's a cancer treatment we ask that i say most of them will simply say i don't know why this phrase quality of life was only introduced to me after a cancer diagnosis, you know, they wish that they would have made quality of life a priority um, before uh, the finish line was brought within a few years in front of them. Now, they do it all in different ways. Some of them said, why am I worrying? Some of them, you know, the, the material things, the encumbrances, the frustrations, a lot of times they go away. Certain people, they cut out of their lives that they always wanted to. I mean, there, it's a, it's an, there's an immediacy to focusing on what brings them joy and happiness while still taking care of tremendous responsibility, dealing with cancer centers and all of that. So when I see them do that, I, I think, you know, maybe that's the lesson for me. That's the gift they've given me that at 48 to not take, you know, not, not to take the time ahead of me for granted. Um, I, I know that's not a specific example, but I would say the lesson here uh, is that phrase quality of life is, is not uh, something we need to think about after we get sick, but really before we get sick. 
And a fantastic way to end today's episode is exactly that. Look at your quality of life. And, you know, it's, it's a great lesson to, to give to people. Rahul, it's been fantastic to chat to you all the way from California. We really appreciate you joining us today. Rahul's new book, Life on a Life's Edge, a brain surgeon's reflection on life, loss and survival is available now. As ever, we'll be back next week with more Real Health. If you liked what you listened to, don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Every single review really helps. Have a great week, folks, and we'll see you next week. Leia Healthcare. Looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.